I want you to picture this. A happy kid running home on a Friday afternoon. It's sunny, the wind is blowing in her hair. She's wearing intentionally mismatched socks. She has that weird smelly breath that kids sometimes get. You know when they breathe like right in your face and it reeks? <laughs> Sorry, you're picturing a happy kid coming home from school. She gets home, she throws her bright orange backpack aside and she does not have a care in the world. You know why? Because it's Friday afternoon and that is the start of her weekend. So let's jump ahead to Saturday. She runs downstairs, but mom's not home. She's hungry, but there's nothing to eat. So this little girl doesn't eat anything. She does this again every weekend for months on end. This is what's known as food insecurity. Food insecurity impacts 1.85 million Texas children, and that's according to a study by Baylor and the Texas Hunger Initiative. That means that one in every four Texas children is food insecure or hungry. That makes Texas the ninth highest state in child food insecurity. All of these statistics mean that Plano, Texas, despite being consistently ranked amongst the best places to live in the entire country, well, the city we call home has hungry kids as well. Well, I too wanted to experience the richness of community. Our city was quickly growing during this season, and as I looked around, it was growing quickly. But at that process, it was becoming a bit more divisive as well. I wanted to be part of the solution. And so I looked around and said, what should I do? What can I personally do? And the one thing I realized that I needed to do was to begin to graciously communicate with other people instead of just about them. Well, so it was that season of 2011, if you'll go there with me. It was about 10 years removed from the falling of the Twin Towers. It was a time of a bit of anger in our community, some angst, a lot of fear, actually. And so it was during that season that I actually called the local mosque and I asked to talk to the local imam. We had a conversation that day and we decided to actually go out to eat. You've got to understand the dynamics of that a little bit, though, because in my world of religion... That's not really normal. We're kind of considered the competition, you got to understand. <laughs> and so we went out to eat that day, and we ate out again and again and again. You got to understand, what I began to understand about Yassin was that Yassin was a great dad. He was a great husband. He was a great pastor to his local congregation. He loved sports, and he loved food. And over the next days, months, and years, we developed an incredible friendship. I know what you're thinking. The man that he is talking about, he sounds great. And he is great. He's also not me. <laughs> the man he's referring to is my imam, the religious leader at my mosque. His name is Yasin Sheikh. Me, well, I'm just a troublemaker that he was stuck teaching when he joined our community 14 years ago. But see, as I spent time with Imam Yasin, I noticed he was doing something. He was challenging the preconceived notions that our community might have had. He was identifying people and projects that we weren't used to working with. He was actually redefining our understanding of the word community. Community, if you think about it, comes from the same root word of commonality. Commonality means that we have things in common. They can be such as we live in proximity to somebody else. We have the same color of skin. We, we talk the same language. And oftentimes, community is built around those commonalities. The problem with that is, sure, it's great to come together around those commonalities. They, they form tight bonds. But at the same time, we actually end up excluding other people from our grouping, from our community. Well, in that time period, Yasin and I began to think about a, a better word, something that we wanted to go after together, and that word is communitas. Now, I don't really want to give you the definition of communitas. Probably the best way that I can explore that word with you is to, is to talk about some examples when I've seen it happen. My wife and I used to live in New Orleans, and we moved here right after Katrina, or right just before Katrina, but it was in the recovery of Katrina that I saw folks coming together. And it didn't really matter the, the language they spoke. It didn't matter what nationality they were. It, it didn't matter what religion they were. They came together for the good of the city of New Orleans. They came together for a mission. 
We saw it locally. We saw it during the tornadoes that happened in South Dallas. And it didn't matter, again, what, what religion you were, what language you spoke. We just cared that we were going to rebuild South Dallas when the tornadoes hit. You, you see it often even in times of war. As individuals come together and they fight on the same team, you know, it doesn't really matter who's in the foxhole next to you as long as they're on mission with you. Let's see, folks. Without communitas, communities suffer from segmentation. And Muslim communities, especially here in the U.S., well, we're notoriously self-segmented. It's like we spend hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to build these walls just so we can hide behind them. We're completely absent from the larger communities that we're supposed to be a part of. And I think it's because human beings have a natural inclination towards exclusivity. I mean, think about it. Any group you're a part of, it's a group because you have some unifying quality, attribute, language, or affiliation that everybody in the group has, but everybody outside the group, they don't have it. And this permeates our lives in a lot of ways, right? Me and my family, for example, we moved to this country in 1997, and we were primed and ready to be part of the fabric of the American society. But when we got here, we found that it wasn't just commonplace, but actually encouraged to make fun of where I came from, to mock our customs, our nationality, even our accents. And I'm talking to you, of course, about my homeland of Canada. All right, okay, we laugh, it's funny, but the harsh reality is this actually permeates our lives in a lot of ways, right? We go out of our way to find reasons to see somebody as different from ourselves, and then we build walls to keep them out of our lives, even if they're just a border away. But see, under the guidance of Imam Yassin Sheikh and a new administration at our mosque, we started to at least bring down the metaphorical walls. And we did this by doing a couple things. We started engaging better with the city of Plano. We started inviting other faith groups to our mosque. And eventually, we even had the courage to start stepping outside of the mosque and engaging with people outside our walls. We were taking our very first steps towards communitas. And so in order to do this, we're going to have to be willing to tear down some barriers. And those barriers, as you know, can be lots of different things. They can be the color of another person's skin. They can be a language, they can be a religion, they can be gender, but we're going to have to tear, tear down those barriers. We're going to have to begin to act and behave differently. You see, something's going to have to change in us if that's going to happen. We're going to have to go after these things that cause barriers and divisions between us. But folks, it shouldn't take things like a tornado or a school shooting to get us towards communitas. We have to choose to overcome this. So if you'll allow us, the pastor and I have three steps to get you and your communities closer to a mentality of communitas. All right, so first of all, we're going to have to choose courage over fear. Courage over fear. We've, we've got to address what our fears really are. Are we really afraid of a, another person's skin color? Are we afraid of their language? Are we, are we really afraid of another person's religion? Or is our religious belief so insecure that we can't actually have a relationship, a dialogue, and a conversation with somebody who is far different than us? And maybe one day our fear of missing out on the richness of communitas would be stronger than the comfort level we have of staying where we are. And what's going to have to happen is something's going to have to actually break inside of us individually if it's ever going to break open inside of our community. And somebody, maybe someone in here, is going to have to have the courage to pick up the phone and make the first phone call. That's right. So step one, choose courage over fear. Step two, connect. Build a bridge. Just get to know that other person or community. And it does not have to be that difficult. I mean... You can just watch a game together. You can invite each other to your space, invite the church to your mosque or vice versa. But you know what? The easiest way to get to know anybody is to just share a meal with them. Why? Well, relationships are formed best and fastest over food. This isn't a platitude, by the way. I can tell you firsthand that Pastor Dwight is exceptional at using food to connect with people. He mentioned Imam Yassin before. Well, in the ideal world, Imam Yassin would be here speaking to you on behalf of my congregation instead of me. But see, I was given this responsibility because Imam Yassin just moved back to England. 
So when I was given this responsibility, something special happened. I just got a text from this guy, Pastor Dwight. And I was like, who is this guy? <laughs> but it was something nice. It said, hey, let's meet over dinner. So we did. And then we met again and again, meal after meal. <laughs> you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what else happened? Yeah, we gained a couple pounds, but we got to know each other. A relationship was formed, and camaraderie, well, it came naturally over shawarmas and Louisiana cuisine. But the thing is, for communitas to happen, it's not just two people connecting. Entire communities have to be willing to actually connect with one another. So, by um, an aside, this guy actually needs to learn how to enjoy some good Louisiana crawfish, it if is somebody true. can help him with that. All right, step one, you got to choose some courage over fear. Second of all, you're going to have to learn, we're going to have to learn to connect with people who are far different from us. But the third thing is, we're going to have to learn to collaborate, collaborate on, on something, something that, that matters, matters to the both, both of us. us. You can collaborate on saying a sentence together. <laughs> <laughs> or you could do what our congregations did. We identified a local project that meant a lot to us, and we found a way for us to give back. So let me clarify what I am talking about and what we're not talking about. I'm not talking about just tolerance. Tolerance is a word that's become a high value in our community. But this is more than tolerance. You see, I didn't want to just tolerate Yasin or tolerate his community of believers. We actually wanted to be friends. How great is that? That we would actually enjoy each other. It's got to be more than tolerance. We wanted more. So our congregations did something very special. We found a local elementary school and we committed to just doing this, buying, packing, and delivering healthy snacks to the school. The snacks would get to the school counselors. The school counselors would then identify kids who needed these healthy snacks. They would covertly place the snacks in these kids' backpacks. The kids would get home on a Friday afternoon and they would find snacks, more than enough to get them through the weekend. But you gotta understand, we couldn't just start doing this out of nowhere. We couldn't start collaborating, which is step three of Communitas, without completing steps one and two. We first had to choose courage. Somebody had to make that phone call and be willing to get to know us. And then, once somebody had that courage, we had to both come together and actually be willing to connect with one, one another. We had to be willing to put aside our differences, and only then could we actually collaborate. So if you picture that little girl we talked about at the beginning, once again, it's Friday afternoon, she runs home, she throws her orange backpack aside, but this time, she sees a bunch of healthy snacks inside the backpack, and she has no idea where these came from, but she's glad just to have them. Similarly, the mosque and the church, we actually have no idea who this little girl is, and that's part of what communitas is. The willingness to give without any expectation of getting anything in return. So while we started to tackle a problem of hunger in our local community, we think we started to tackle a much bigger problem, a problem of division and mistrust between communities. We started to handle a problem that's not that easy. See, buying food, a lot of us can do that. But solving mistrust and division, that's exponentially harder. But if you can do it, well then, all these other problems our communities have, they're going to start to fade away. Right. So we want to leave you with a challenge. The next time this compassion wells up inside of you, you want to make a difference in the world, we, we want to encourage you to pause. Don't immediately run to the person who is closest in proximity to, to you or the person who's most like you. Instead, choose courage over fear. Choose to connect with someone who may be far different than you. And go after the richness of this thing called communitas and choose to collaborate with people who are far different than you while changing the world. And you guys, you're inspired. You've heard a lot of great inspirational speeches today and you want to change the world. And you know what? I believe you can and I believe you will change the world. But you have to remember, it's not just how can I change the world. It's who can I change the world with. Thank you.